Uh, welcome to Technically Speaking, Improve Your Code with Documentation. This is my first in-person conference since the before times, and I am so happy to be in London. I am so happy to be in London with all of you. But before we get to all the good stuff, I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna talk about. Why is a writer, I'm a technical writer, why am I at PHP UK? What makes good docs? And really importantly, uh, what do you not need to worry about when creating documentation? I'll talk about the keys to good writing. The, the secrets are knowing your purpose and knowing your audience. How we optimize the deliverables, and that's the, the really like meaty part of the talk. We're gonna get through a bunch of it and you'll think, how does she have more slides? The deliverables. And then I'll remind you, okay, so what? Once again, why are you here? What do you, what do you have to say to us? And hopefully leave you with six actionable takeaways that you can start implementing right now. But first, hi, <laughs> my name is Alexandra White and I'm a technical writer at Google. I work on the Privacy Sandbox, which is a part of Chrome's initiative to protect user privacy while also protecting companies as they grow their businesses online, all very important. Uh, but before I was a technical writer, I was a web developer. In fact, the first like real language I learned was PHP. I love PHP, it is very, very deep and close to my heart. Uh, and I was an engineer at a television station in New York City called WNET. At the TV station, there were four other engineers that I worked with. They worked there for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. Nice little intervals of time. <laughs> and we were supporting websites from when the first engineer started building websites. So uh, a lovely little site from 1999 uh, that, you know, if you didn't already know where it was, good luck. Uh, you would never find it and you would never know if I change something, is everything going to break? Hopefully not. Mm, we'll learn. All, all of the knowledge was like locked in their heads and the role of new junior developer just kept switching out, kept switching out. And that's obviously really unsustainable. You can't uh, run a code base and have no documentation to speak of, like really zero documentation. It was, it was quite tragic and I couldn't live that way. So I decided, okay, how do I, how do I convince these folks who have been here for so long to actually start creating documentation? So I launched a blog for our engineers, and I thought, this is, this is gonna get them. They're gonna wanna write blog posts. And I thought, you, you know, we built mostly WordPress websites. The WordPress community, very engaging. Uh, they'll wanna share all of their expertise with the world. At least one of them was really enthusiastic, wrote so many blog posts, I was thrilled, thrilled. But of course, I didn't actually want a blog post and a blog for everyone else. I wanted it for me. Totally selfish. How do I learn from the engineers? This is the way to do it. Make it not about me. And I knew that that wasn't actually the only way to address a problem of documentation. A blog is not documentation on its own. Uh, it was important to introduce readmes. Maybe you've, you're familiar with them. And, code comments, just like the little, the little things that you, you think they'll be there, right? I'll be able to know what things are. No. Uh, and in 2016, I ended up going to a conference on infrastructure, learning all about, if you were in the opening talk of the day, microservices and, uh, you know, we've all, we've all uh, heard the big talks at that moment. And I had no idea what anything meant. I was there as a, a point of like, okay, this is, this is the part of the internet I don't understand, so maybe I'll learn something. And I met an engineer there. He was like, oh, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a web developer, and also, I do this thing. I started a blog, and I'm trying to get my engineers to write docs, and it's really hard because I feel like I'm the only one who cares. I just want people to care about docs. And he said, how about, you only care about docs. 
how about you take a job being a technical writer? And I thought, oh, I could do that. I could, I'm good at that, I could do that. And then I can take technical writing jobs and help people do their jobs more efficiently. So now I'm a full-time technical writer. As you all know very well, you've heard me for two, three minutes. Uh, <laughs> and my goal is to make information for non-technical folks sort of technical, like they've heard some terms, and highly advanced, the, the smartest people I've ever worked with, make docs for everybody. No pressure. No pressure. Everything's fine. My boss is here, but no pressure. It's fine. <laughs> but despite the fact that I write documentation exclusively now, I really think that all engineers should be involved in documentation. I do better work when I get to work with engineers who care about documentation and care about participating in documentation. Ultimately, in my job, I, have, I don't have expertise of how to build the code. I can't do the work of the other engineers. My job is to understand what they're talking about and then communicate that back to other engineers so that they can understand and build more things. Really, I, I write for an audience, as I said, some non-technical folks, some really, really highly so smart, it's totally intimidating <laughs> kinds of folks. And it's really important that I know who's on the other side of the document. Like, I'm gonna use some words for those super highly technical folks that they'll know. Um, but if the folks coming to the document don't know what a service worker is, which came up recently in documentation, it's like, okay, how do I explain what this is? I don't need to, to use the term, I can define it. So I'm sure everybody here has started a new job and thought, Okay, I am lost. Uh, did the last person hate me? Did they just, did they want me to suffer? Where is everything? Where are the, where is the organization? Where are the notes? Why is there 8,000 files in one directory? Who made this choice? Who made it? Uh, and, you know, you need a lot of things to really be successful. No matter how good you are at your job, your life is better with documentation. Documentation is a tool for success for yourself. Again, selfishly, I started a blog so that I could learn. It's also a tool for your future self for when you've finished a project and then you're asked to return to it at a later date, which I've got a great story to share with you about that. <laughs> and your colleagues, your colleagues love when you write documentation, I promise. And of course, the person who takes your job after you will also, they don't need to know your name, but they will think of you so fondly. Whenever I, I work with software engineers, there are, there are some folks who say, I'm not good at writing. Like, that's, that's your job. I do the code, you do the writing, and there's a reason it's that way. But I have really, really good news for you. You're writers, congratulations. You don't have to do anything else. You are already writing. You, at minimum, I know everyone in this room has written one, two, 7,000 emails. Uh, you tweet, possibly. You send text messages. You are writing. You are writing every day. You. You probably are doing at least a little bit of work-related writing. I'm assuming that if you're here, some portion of you are like, oh yeah, I know docs are important, that's why I'm going to go to the docs talk. And then some other folks are like, um, I don't know, I don't know, and I respect that. <laughs> I'm fortunate now to work at a company where documentation is so important that there's teams of technical writers to, to do that work. And my work is different than the kind of documentation that you create. My job goes beyond just like writing a piece of documentation. That's probably 5% of the work that I do. The rest of it is going and talking to people, asking questions, trying to figure out what do our, what do our users need to know? Uh, what, what are the things that are locked 
lock in your brain that I need to get out onto paper and try and understand the systems because if I don't understand, I can't, I can't write about it. Not well, anyway. I love working with engineers who are writing documentation. It, it makes me feel more valued and I think they feel valued in being able to share their expertise and also know that somebody is there, someone's their ally to help make their documentation as good as it possibly can be. But ultimately, again, the kind of technical writing that I do, it's not totally why we're here. You don't need to necessarily know how to become a technical writer, though if you want to, come talk to me. I'm available, there's question time. The kind of writing that I do is different than the kind of writing that you'll do. So let's talk about what good docs look like. And first we're gonna start with not so good docs. Good documentation is not Hamlet. Good documentation is not paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of beautiful flowery prose and adjectives. It, complex language. Good documentation is clear, concise, and to the point. Good docs, you don't need to worry about all of the, the fluff. When I was in school, I used something called Cliff's Notes to try and actually understand the assigned readings. Remember when I was first assigned Hamlet, being like, this doesn't look like my English. What is this? I don't get this. <laughs> and Cliff's Notes supplemented various Shakespeare's text, other, other novels, it's possible you've, had, you've been familiar with it. And if you're familiar with Hamlet, which I'm sure many of you are, probably all of you, then you, I wonder if you'll know the, the soliloquy from just the modern day translation. Life or death, existence, is it better to live and suffer or should I take action to stop existing? To be or not to be, it's iconic. Everyone knows it, even if, if you don't know it, you know it. And you probably know what he's trying to say He's moody, he has a lot of feelings, he's, he's talking existentially, oh, should I exist, should I, should I end it all? But you know, we're not really here to talk about what Hamlet has to say. <laughs> really what I'm trying to say is that the, the flowery prose, the, the real written text has no place in documentation. You don't need to do it. I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure of, if I'm writing, I have to like, write all the good words and it's got to be like super good so if it's not then I can't do it. Let's leave all of the adjectives and the metaphors and and the the visualizations to to marketers who are super good at that and essayists and novelists. Translation alone however doesn't actually equal documentation. Writing documentation isn't what's being done in your code, it's the context. It's adding, adding things to help your reader be successful. Translation is important, it helps some people understand, and you hope that the, the functions that you write, that everything looks somewhat like, oh, someone who has experience could follow this. But there are times when you need, you need a little extra help to, to get through a piece of code. Technical writing, clear, concise, and conscientious commentary. And I also want to be really clear, you know, as it is my job, to once again set expectations for the kind of writing that you all can, should, will, maybe already are doing. Your job is to fully understand your code bases that you work in and the features that you write. and then write that information down as documentation. You are more likely, if you write documentation, to understand what you do, uh, to be able to explain it to somebody else when, when a product manager walks up to you and goes, what's that? What's this thing? Can you, can you explain it to me? Uh, being able to explain it in more concise language, really gonna make their life a lot better. And also, 
you'll be able to remember it in the future. The actual act of writing it down, typing it, helps you solidify in your brain the things that you did. And while things like, like grammar, I can't say it doesn't matter. It matters to some degree, but also, don't worry about it. Spelling mistakes, don't worry about it. It's far more important to just get documentation and then you can worry about the rest later. Get it all out of your head and onto a piece of paper or your computer, because, you know, it probably makes more sense. Writing is one of those things like, you know, cleaning out your fridge or exercising that people hate. People passionately say that they hate writing um, or passionately say that they hate running. I hate running. Running should be abolished. Why do people run for fun? What's wrong with you? No, you can run for fun. I don't want to judge your hobbies. I won't, but you, you do that. <laughs> but there are people who, who write every day and enjoy it, and then there are people who learn to do it because they know it's important. Writing is good for you, too. Writing is how I learned how to code. Like I said, PHP, first, the first language that I really got my, my hands into, and it, it just really it opened my eyes to like, oh, there are so many different things I can do more than just, you know, bold text in my live journal. It's fine. <laughs> when I was at my second year at university, I took my first intro to web development class. For that, I'd really only just tinkered around. I didn't know it was an option. I didn't know it was something you could do. And in class day number four, the teacher walked up to me and said, hey, you seem to know what you're doing. Can you teach the next class on CSS? What? <laughs> Why are you asking me? I'm the student in intro to web development. Why would you do that? The reason is because our first project was we had to build a portfolio, and that was required. I, I studied professional writing. When you graduate, you have to build a website. It's part of the deal. And so it's like, well, I could try and write HTML and CSS and do a horrible job, but I don't want to have to look at that. I don't want my, my uh, fellow students to have to look at such an abomination. So I decided to find a template and transform it a bit. You know, choose my own colors, choose my own fonts, move things around, make it mine, cheat. Some might say they might say cheat, but who here hasn't cheated? We've all cheated. Cheating is in fact encouraged is my understanding. I didn't know that at the time, but copying off of Stack Overflow, love it, <laughs> love it. So obviously I did a, a minimum work with maximum impact. And the professor saw that project and thought, I don't know why she's in intro. She must know how to do everything. And I was not about to correct her. Yeah, totally. I'm a savant. Uh, I'm a genius. Don't worry about it. You can definitely, I can definitely teach CSS. So I spent the next two days going through my file and commenting as much as I could because I didn't know what anything, anything did. What's the difference between display block and display inline block? How is there, how is there hierarchy, understanding, an ID, and class, and all of those things? After that, after going through the file, then I was more, was I the teacher or an assistant, assistant professor? Who can say? doesn't matter. I felt more equipped to talk to all of the students in my class about CSS and answer their questions and not feel totally unprepared and to, in the future, actually be able to write it myself to some degree. You know, it's always changing. Learning is a two-step process. When we learn, the first step is common, again, to everybody. It's the act, the act of absorption reading, watching videos, listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks, absorb all of the information. Step two is what you do with that information, taking action. And that could be writing down what you learned, using, using your own words to understand, and even better, 
teaching somebody else what you learn. Oh, I just listened to this, this great podcast about uh, 1940s Hollywood, and I've got to tell you all about it. This, this theory isn't, I am not special and unique in this theory. This theory was developed by Eric Mazur at Harvard University, and he calls it the flipped classroom. How do we actually get kids to, to learn by teaching? I became a better developer by explaining the code that I wrote, actually having to ask and answer questions about it with people, and sometimes saying, I don't know why it does that. It, it does it, and that's what I want it to do, so that's fine. But investigating at a later date, so I could go back to that person and say, I know why my code does this. I, I can understand and explain it now. Writing is an important part of your efficiency. If you write documentation first, if you start there, and especially if you write good documentation first, then you are so much better positioned to write more code, write better documentation in the future. The, you get to avoid the hundreds of emails of what's happening, what is this? This doesn't make any sense to me. If, if you do that extra work up front, then you don't need to do it afterwards when you might not quite remember how you did the things and your support team if you have a support team is really going to appreciate it and your customers appreciate it and your colleagues appreciate it you will also appreciate it running good for your heart and health i guess it's important <laughs> exercise of some of some kind is good for you writing is good for you too it is Good writing is, is hard. I, I don't want to say like, okay, now we can all write the best stuff. Uh, it takes a lot of practice. I'm still constantly learning and reading other people's writing. Like I, just like learning to code, I become a better writer by reading other people's writing and implementing their genius strategies. Writing shows how much you care about yourself, your colleagues, and your users. Documentation shouldn't be sprinkles. I love sprinkles, but no. Sprinkles are decorative, more often than not, like colorful crunch that's added at the end, added on top of your dessert, on top of your ice cream. Documentation shouldn't be the last thing on your list that feels like, well, I have to do that. It's on the list of things I have to do. It should be integrated throughout your entire work process. And in the United States, as you might be able to tell, I'm American. <laughs> I'm from New York. And we love confetti cake. Confetti cake, number one birthday cake. There's a, a box mix. It's called Funfetti. I wonder if you have it here. If you don't, that's a tragedy for you. <laughs> Documentation should be like what makes confetti cake so awesome. It's totally, it's totally integrated throughout. There is colorful sprinkles everywhere, non-stop sprinkles. <laughs> Remember that, again, you're not expected to be perfect. Not every piece uh, of documentation needs to be the best writing. You don't have to do every single thing. Also, like, if you are starting from a place where I don't really, I don't really do so much docs right now, start small. Work your way up. The best way to, to start a habit is not to feel like, okay, I'm going to use the running analogy again. I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. You would collapse. It, if you've never run a marathon before or never run a mile before, wouldn't work out. Start small. So everyone now agrees, right, that writing is important and that we should all do it. Um, I hear your enthusiastic hollers in my heart. Thank you. <laughs> so now that, now that we all agree and are all on the same page, we can talk about like how to do it. Uh, we can talk about knowing your purpose and knowing your audience. Why are you writing? Why are you creating documentation other than you were told by your boss, you better have something. You better have something to go along with that. But specifically, why are you creating any one kind of document and what problem does it solve? 
answering those questions is really key to the success of any kind of content. Does your document exist to inform someone of something? Do you need to, to give a high level overview because you've created something that's really complicated, really complex, but someone in leadership or just the general public, they need to have an introduction. You can't just go right in and, and hit them with, with all the details, high level overview. Or do you need to share all of the little details? Are you giving this, are you passing this project along to somebody else and saying it's your problem now, but I'll explain it to you first? Or does this document exist to instruct? Are you trying to tell someone how to complete a, a set of tasks? Do you need to, to help them run a process or help them get set up with a plugin? Is your product required to comply with federal, state, or local regulations? Everyone in this room is familiar with that. Um, I remember once doing a talk a number of years ago, and, and I talked about compliance, and I was told by another American, uh, only, the only people who care about compliance are Americans. You, you know, we love to sue people, which is true. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's, that's not true. We all care about compliance. And I have a much deeper understanding of that in my current position than ever before. Compliance really matters. Using the right words matters. That's probably the least uh, fun part of writing when you think like I've done a good job explaining this and then the lawyers come back to you and say, you can't say that. You also can't say that. Scratch out half of this, do it again, do it again. It's, it's not fun necessarily, but we all have to do it. We all have to write compliance documentation sometime. Ultimately, understanding why you're writing will help you write the best kind of documentation and not feel sad when your documentation is torn apart. <laughs> but even more important than the why you're writing is who is your audience? Who are you writing for? This audience consideration is important because if you don't have a clear understanding of what they know, you can't preemptively answer the questions that they have, and they have probably a lot of questions. Whoever's reading your document has questions. So who's, who's reading the document and how are they approaching it? It's really easy to say, me, I'm the one reading the doc, and answer questions for yourself. And that is important. But it's very possible that the person reading your documentation doesn't look like you, doesn't have your level of education, might be, might be a new hire who has some understanding of the language that you're building in, or maybe they have no experience. Maybe they're a, a Java developer who's coming into a job where you mostly write PHP, and you know there's, there's a bit of a, a changeover in thought. So, and also, how is your audience interacting with your content? Are they on their, their desktop or their laptop and reading it because they need to learn about a new thing? Are they panicking because they have to accomplish something to, to do their job and it's been hours, days, some amount of time, and if they can't figure it out soon, they might lose their job. That happens. When writing, consider, consider the following audiences. The first audience to consider is the easiest when creating any kind of documentation. You, <laughs> me, <laughs> very adorable, I think. <laughs> the best way to understand your own work is to explain it to yourself. When you clearly understand the, the confines of your code, you're, you're much better equipped to build more and build better. But why, why does this say past you? Why am I showing you a, um, my ninth birthday? I had a Barbie cake. It was, oh, it was so good. <laughs> it's possible before you actually started building, you did start with some documentation. Maybe you wrote, maybe you wrote a design document. Maybe all of your hopes and dreams from the design document came true. Or half of the things, you know, things change. Things change when you actually get into building it because you learn of 
various concerns, various expectations. So it's possible little me, little nine-year-old me, was really convinced um, she was going to be an actor. She was going to be on stage. She was going to star in musicals. And I still am on stage. I did it. <laughs> it's different. It's different. I'm talking as me. Uh, and I have expertise in something which is weird. Uh, I don't get to, I don't hide behind um, song and dance and performance anymore. <laughs> Writing documentation fills in the gaps between what you thought a product would be and how it ended up. But even more critical than your past self is future you. Writing for your future self because future you often forgets what past you has done. You can't, except for those people who have photographic memories, and I am so jealous, so jealous, you can't hold on to everything in your head. You have to, you know, forget some things so you can fill it, your brain with more new information. How many times, though, have you worked on a, a project, on a new feature, and then been asked to, to go back to it and make changes? A couple weeks, a couple months later, maybe a couple years. At the, at the television station, I built a plug-in for people to play bingo. Uh, it, was, it was quite fun. It was a special request for one of the TV shows that we had a website for. And I thought, I have a great idea. This plugin is so good, I'm gonna open source it. Not really knowing what open source meant. So what I thought it meant was you put it on GitHub and then it's open source and you don't have to do anything else. No. <laughs> so four years later, after I've long, I've stopped developing full time, I'm now writing documentation. My PHP is rusty a little rusty, <laughs> two people, two separate groups of people emailed me and said, hey, we saw you have a plugin for Bingo for WordPress. That's so cool. We want to use it, but it's broken. Can you fix that? And I said, yeah, I can totally fix that. I don't know. Maybe I'll figure it out. And I looked back I looked back at the code and was like, I don't remember what half of this stuff is. I don't remember how to properly write PHP, let alone uh, try and solve problems for WordPress 4.0 when we are currently in WordPress, I think it was 5.8. Like, obviously the code broke. Not surprised at all. And it was a, a fun learning exercise. Um, I went back to the plugin, I, I figured it out, I figured out what the major problems were, passed me, decided the only documentation that I needed to do was tell somebody how to install a plugin on WordPress, which is very commonly documented in WordPress's documentation. They didn't need that. They needed to know how to actually use this plugin and know like how to fix it. Could have saved myself a lot of time. And for those of you who aren't loan developers, those of you who work on a team, then it's really important to write documentation to help the rest of the team know the kind of work that you've been up to and know what you've done. It's also possible that your projects might be reassigned. You might leave your team and go to another team. You might leave your team entirely and the, the folks left have to pick up the things that you've left. Most of us don't stay at one job forever, once again, I'll never leave you, Rowan, I'll never leave you. <laughs> but it's possible that you might move on to, to something else and take another opportunity. I'm very lucky that I have colleagues all over the world who I trust to, to keep, keep the lights on while I get to be in front of all of you talking about docs. And a lot of, a lot of this, I feel like uh, a big lack in documentation is not external documentation. Companies have, you know, caught on. Technical instruction manuals have existed forever. There are good ones, there are bad ones. But internal documentation is often the most neglected work, and I just want to say that before I talk about the people who you don't work with. Don't forget about your colleagues. They really matter. They matter the most. If you are a web developer, 
you might find that you have to write instructions for a client to know how to update their website. And again, WordPress, my knowledge, uh, one of the best things is content management system, totally separate from the code. Theoretically, they shouldn't need to, to look at any of that to be able to do, uh, a content writer shouldn't need to know how to look at the code to do their job. But if you made any customizations, things that they can't find in the other like CMS docs, it's important that you create docs so that your clients don't email you on Saturday at 11 p.m. and say, there's a typo and the world is burning, you need to fix it. Like, well, if you just looked at page three of the docs, which you would know because there's a table of contents, you would know that you could fix that typo. You don't need to email me. But on a larger scale than a, a single web developer and a single client, you could be building a product for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, millions of people could use your product. Uh, that generally gets a lot more funding and support for, for good documentation. You, by writing docs, you don't, again, get those emails asking, how do I do this? That's not true, I just lied to you. You will definitely still get those emails, but maybe you'll get less, maybe less angry. Help your users help themselves, help yourself sleep at night. Knowing who your audience is in this group of, of potential audiences, where three of them are me, <laughs> it's really critical to determining the kind of documentation that you should be creating, asking, asking those questions of yourself before you start writing. And it's possible that your docs cover more than one. It's more than likely it's at least two or at least three, sometimes all four. Don't assume that the external folks know anything at all. Like, make sure that you, you really think about, okay, what can I expect them to know? Our product has rebranded four times. They're not gonna maybe know any of the in-between. For the most part, folks outside of your company, they, they're not gonna know as much as employees unless possibly they worked there before and are like, I know all your secrets. You, don't, you can't hide from me. Often, though, there are new hires, there are junior engineers. I think about, about me back when I was so full of hope. Uh, <laughs> she, she, being me, um, really was enthusiastic to learn and didn't know what questions to even ask because I didn't know what I didn't know. There's, there's this thing called the curse of knowledge. We, when we learn something and it becomes a part of your everyday reality, you know it and you might think, you talk to other people like, well, everybody else knows this too. And it's really important to fight against that instinct, especially when writing uh, high level overviews and introductory materials. Talk to them like they don't know what you know. Some, some tips for, for fighting the curse of knowledge, spell out words. If there are acronyms that are used frequently, at least define the word first and then put the acronym in, in parentheticals and parentheses. For example, PII, very common. Folks in here probably have heard that before, but I don't wanna assume. It's possible someone here is brand new and this is their first conference. And they also, um, haven't looked at a lot of GDPR stuff. Uh, PII, personal identifying information. Spell it out, then you can use the acronym as much as you want. Be precise, use exact measurements. If there is a limitation to the number of queries that you can run, please don't say, you can run a lot of queries, but don't run too many. Tell me when it's gonna break. I wanna know when it's gonna break because, you know, Maybe my use case is I do need to run a million queries in one hour somehow. <laughs> and precise terminology is important too. So like, like acronyms, jargon, uh, those words that you come to know when you work at a larger company, the, the things that, again, you forget that 
that you use words that other people outside of your company don't use. Use, if you're gonna use the terms that people don't know, define it. Like, just put a little explanation of what it is. Have a glossary, I love a glossary, big fan. Once you have your purpose and you know who you're writing for, then you can decide actually what the deliverables are. This is, this is the good stuff. What kind of things are we writing? What are we focusing on? The best time to write documentation is to write while you code. I, I think I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again. Write documentation while you're coding instead of waiting until you're done. You will be so much happier, I promise. And the easiest way to do that is to write comments. You know, human-friendly information in the midst of, of the machine-readable information. Remember Hamlet? Hamlet's soliloquy. I added, mo I added modern English as comments to, to explain what the soliloquy was trying to say. The comments have the specific purpose of translation, interpretation. Additional comments could talk about what one line means in the context of the play, talk more about why Hamlet's so upset. Dead dad, spoiler alert, very sad. <laughs> Comments look, look different for, for PHP in different coding languages. Sometimes they look the same, but they all accomplish the same goal. One of the products I used to cover, no longer cover, is called Google Publisher Tag. Google Publisher tag needed a lot of comments, needed a lot of comments. I was told that back when they first built this, this tagging API, it was a single line of JavaScript and that was it. And people could just have ads on their website. Sounds nice. Um, the, the image on the screen, you don't need to be able to read it, is just part of the, the documentation of the single line that you need to embed on your website to have ads. The, the docs for GPT, see I defined Google Publisher tag and now I say GPT. It's good to say that out loud. Uh, <laughs> the docs for GPT used to live in the help center, which generally at Google, what that means is it's for users who may not have the most uh, technical experience. The people using the Google Ad Manager help center were the folks who worked in the ad manager interface, the ad buyers, the people who were like, okay, I have this space next to my news article and I need to sell it so that we can continue to have news. That's the people who are using the interface. They looked at this page and thought, what is this? No, thank you. I will not be doing that. So I worked with the developer relations engineer and we got all of the super technical content moved out of the help center where it didn't belong into developer documentation. But the comments were still really important for the developers too. It really bridged the gap between who worked in the, in the interface and the developers themselves. The thing about GPT is there are really specific rules for how, how it has to be organized. The, the comment says, specify the network 1234 and targeted ad unit travel asia indicate multiple sizes with the syntax width one height one and this is this is the really important line for multi-size ad slots declare slot sizes in the same order as in the ad manager ui so if you're looking at the code you're and you're reading the function names define slot if you work in ads, you probably know that's, okay, I'm defining where my ad slot, where the ad lives. I see ad service is another function. I'm adding the service of Google Publisher tags to my site. But all the stuff in the middle, you might assume, okay, it needs to be in that order. But to the detail, the sizes, if you do not do the exact same thing as in the interface, the code will break. Is that a flaw in the way the code is built? Sure, sure it is. But we can't fix that right now, so we'll fix it with comments. <laughs> Ultimately, the code, the code explains the action it takes. Define slot explains that it's going to define the ad slot. The comments add that really extra important context that you might not otherwise know by looking at the code. 
So here's an example of a bad comment. Set the value of age variable to 32. And then we see variable age equals 32. Self-explanatory, I think. Your comments should be adding context, not defining what the reader can know by looking at your code. Add a comment instead that says the age must be an integer, not a string, if that is really important to the way this, things work. Possibly if the, the variable exists in a file outside of where the function lives, you could say, oh, this is for this special thing. It's for the find age difference function. Must be an integer. This is the added value rather than the self-explanatory information. After you're done, after you've, you've written uh, most of the code, you can start to write a readme. Love readmes. It gives a summary of your project, tells someone a little about it. It's for future you, it's for your colleagues, it's for external developers who want to be able to work with your project. And it's really, it's really useful to find out, too, if there has been new releases or a list of bug fixes. Developer Andre Sitnik built this project. It's called Size Limit. It's a, a JavaScript performance plugin. I tried. I really tried. I was looking through various different GitHub repositories to find um, a good PHP-focused example, and I didn't really come across one. So if you know one, tell me afterwards. I would like to know, and I'd like to see it. I know it exists, and somebody in this room knows about it. Size limit is, is great, though, because it clearly defines what, what's in the project, like why you would be in this repository. It gives itself some credibility. It says some companies who are using it. Uh, it gives the reader instructions for how to install it and who to contact if things go horribly wrong. What makes a good readme? All these things. Project title. Pretty self-explanatory. You want to, you know, Call the project something, not here's my project. In the project description, also good to not just say here's my project. Uh, you can define in a sentence, two sentences, three sentences, what the project is for. Define the prerequisites, any configuration needs. Do I need to update my bash profile to do something? Do I need to make sure that I have some version of some uh, dependency installed? It's frustrating to get all the way through to building a thing and then it breaks and you don't know why and it's because you didn't have the really specific version of something installed because you weren't told. Speaking of which, installation, how do I install a thing? How do I use this? Whatever the project is, how do I, how do I go about uh, doing something with it? How do I contribute if it's open source? Um, is there a way, can I just open a, a pull request and, and add code? Is that cool? It's possible that there might be a whole long list of things that you should do to contribute, in which case there are separ separate contributing files, which you probably know. Those are terrific. You could also list contributors if somebody has really made an impact and like made this project what it is. Contact. It's important, uh, if you were at Rob's talk earlier, then you may know you don't necessarily want to put your own email. It's good to have a general email of content so that you're not uh, bombarded by questions. Uh, and of course, especially if it's open source, what license does it fall under? You probably can skip those, those last three things, um, contributing contact and license, if this is all internal. Bonus points, bonus points. How do you make your readme even better? If it's long, a table of contents. I want to be able to skip ahead. Like, I've read this before. I know what this is. I just want to know if there are new releases that I need to be aware of, if there were bugs. Images or GIFs, if there's specific ways to install it, those are really beneficial to, to actually be able to see it. Links to further reading. If you're using a, a really particular uh, language that maybe, maybe it's new, it's good to link back directly to that documentation. And possibly, if you need it, frequently asked questions, which often is, is a weird thing. We decide what the questions are and then decide this is what people ask us. 
uh, but possibly you'll get a lot of questions about your code and then you can say, oh, it seems like everybody's wondering this one thing. Maybe I'll actually include it in my frequently asked questions section. There are also, there are CLIs that automatically create readmes, but it's good to, to put the thought and time and love into readmes. It's also really important to write step-by-step -step instructions. You know, it's probably, I think when people think documentation, this is probably what you think of, like how do I, how do I one, two, three, do a thing? This is telling your colleagues, your future self, how do I do a project? It could be external facing, meaning you're telling your users how to set something up or how to uh, do some kind of process. These step-by-steps make huge difference in the usability of any project. Step-by-step -step instructions can be written tutorials, most often. They can be a, a series of GIFs. They can be a screencast of somebody walking through how to do something. But it's really important to remember accessibility. If you do create a screencast, that's awesome. Include a transcript for folks. Uh, include written instructions. Images and videos do not replace written instructions. They are wonderful supplemental materials. So here's an example of some bad instructions. Fry potatoes, eat chips. I think I know what that's for. I am assuming it is a, it is a chip recipe, but what if I don't know how to, to fry the potatoes and like what size do I cut them? And also is eating really a part of the instructions? Someone shouldn't have written these. They should write better. Though it, it reminds me, you know, technical challenges, the Great British Bake Off, every American loves the Great British Bake Off. We love it so much. It's just so everyone's so nice. But let's look at a different version of that recipe for crispy chips. In this version, separate it out. There's a list of ingredients. You need large potatoes. You need something to fry it in, be it beef tallow or oil. You need salt. Very important. Chips without salt are an absolute tragedy. Maybe you need serving accoutrement mayonnaise. You might need a bunch of tools, so a knife to cut those potatoes, a large pot to, to fry in, and then there's a list of nine steps. This might actually even be a little, a little too much if you are familiar with the process of frying. If you cook all the time, this is probably too detailed for you. Different, somebody who's comfortable in the kitchen will be able to follow this very easily. Um, sometimes I think about, I have a friend who cannot cook, cannot cook to save her life. I've eaten dinner with her um, twice, and I will not be doing it again. And she was really excited about uh, Blue Apron, a meal delivery kit, and, but she, she said to me, you know, I'm trying to learn how to cook, and the instructions don't make any sense. They're written as if you already know how to do the things, and that's, that's a design choice that they made, that it was more important for the documents to look really pretty than to tell people how to do the things. Not necessarily bad, but she wasn't the right audience. Writing documents from scratch, hard. It's super hard. Full-time technical writers, we struggle with it too. Uh, to have to start from the beginning every time and not have constructions, is burdensome. And the best key to that is templates. Like know what you're gonna write before you have to write it. If you have technical writers available at your disposal, they'll probably be really happy to create a template for you that you can work with. Just tell them more about the kind of docs that you need to write. I do have some samples for you. It will be in a repository that will be linked at the end of this talk. And there's a piece of writing that you maybe are already doing if you are, you know, if you're a developer in the audience, if you're a software engineer. Release notes. Release notes can be anything from, hey, here's a new thing, to oopsies, we had problems and we fixed it. It's all good now. The most important thing about release notes is that they let users know that something has changed in a product and it's going to potentially affect them, or something has changed and you don't need to worry about it. 
the updates, you'll never see what it affected. The change might be, again, new feature, way the product works, uh, it could be the removal of a feature or an entire deprecation. Here's a release note from one of my favorite apps, Dailyo. It's a, it's a mood tracking app, you know, say I was really happy on Wednesday. And this bad release note, it's, it's bad. Um, they're being a little cheeky uh, and they're trying, what the release note is trying to tell you is that they've made changes for iOS's dark and light mode. But you really have to know what was happening on, on Apple's side to know that. You need to, to be aware of those changes and you need to read this twice or three times to be like, oh, okay, I get it. And having fun in release notes, I don't wanna discourage you. It can be fun to read cheeky release notes, but you also have to be really clear and tell the people what they need to know. You can't just have fun, sadly. So let's talk about this one that all of us have seen, bug fixes, performance improvement. The iconic release note should have it, you know, tattooed on my body. All, all of the applications, all the time. Especially if, you know, there's more than one little change. Like, please, please tell me what happened. I just, I need more information to know if it's worth my data to, to immediately update if, if I'm uh, vulnerable to, to an attack of some kind. And I say all of that also knowing, once again, legal might come back to you and say, no, you will not tell people that we ever had any problems. We are perfect. You can just tell them that they need to update. Okay, in that case, but I just highly doubt that, you know, if you have a string of 40 applications to update, that 30 of them really needed the same legal reason. I don't believe you. Tell me more information. Release notes are, are definitely subjective. Again, some readers just want the cold hard facts. Some people expect entertainment. They expect to be delighted. What, what the best things to remember are, provide useful, meaningful, informative content. Like that is, that is what the purpose of a release note should be. Tell me what happened. Be human. Assume that your readers are also human, probably. <laughs> and balance creativity with facts. It's good, you have some fun. I do encourage fun. I don't wanna um, say that you should never make jokes, jokes are good. But if you're not actually telling the user what they need to know, they're not gonna do the thing that you want them to do. Many, many talks have been given on better release notes. I could spend an entire hour talking about release notes. Uh, I really recommend Learning to Love Release Notes by Ann Edwards. She's a wonderful technical writer. I'm just gonna to cover three templates and three examples that she uses. The first template Anne shares is, you can now, you can now accomplish something. It's a new thing that a user can do, such as targeting very specific time ranges. The next template, X now does Y, or X no longer does Y. This, there was a feature that existed and you can't do it anymore, sorry, or congratulations, that thing you've been asking for for five years, you can do it now. Isn't that great? And last, X no longer does Y. This means you no longer need to do Z. And this says that a product has, again, stopped doing something, but that means that you no longer, the user no longer needs to do a workaround to get it to do what it wants. It's quite nice. So once again, Ann Edwards, look her up, she's great. Blog posts. You all remember, probably. I love the blog. Blog is like really cool. Uh, you can use it for documentation. Blogs alone are not documentation, but they are often used and they are a more fun kind of documentation. You get to, you get to uh, be more delightful, I think. You get to be more casual. You know, you could even market your skills. It's how I got hired to be a technical writer, but you could be 
hired for other engineering jobs by saying, here's my technical blog. Possibly some folks have one and I look forward to reading it. So for those of you who are up for the challenge and admittedly, blogging is not for everyone. I think that often when people think about writing, they might be intimidated, like this is, you have to write these long things, you have to be funny, you have to do whatever things, it doesn't matter. You don't have to write blog posts. This is the least important kind of documentation, but also some documentation matters. So if you're only gonna write blog posts, I take it back, it's the most important, write a lot of blog posts. On my current team, we have two blogs. We have developer.chrome.com, it's where we cover Chrome-specific related content, new feature releases, uh, engineering platform features, all the things that are happening that are cool and new, exclusive to Chrome. And then we have web.dev, which is where we cover general web things. Possibly you, you've read it. Uh, we, we cover cross-browser performance site trends, things happening, changes you can make to your interfaces, etc. Blog posts, they're less formal, but they're ways to share your expertise. What makes a good blog post? Asking questions, shocking. So who are you? How should a reader know to trust that you know what you're talking about? You don't have to say at the beginning of every post, my name is Alexandra White, I've been a technical writer for uh, many years and I have expertise and you can totally trust me because here's all my credentials. You don't need to do that. Uh, but having a, a bio at the bottom is good so people can you know, go and see how do they know what they know. You, how do you know uh, how, how something matters? Like why, hmm, lost the thought. Uh, why should the reader spend time reading this content? Why does it matter? It's important to tell them why it matters. And what do you want your user to get out of the post? That's not a question that you're asking in the post. It's questions to ask yourself so you can write the best possible content. Should they walk away knowing how to do something? Should they be able to accomplish a goal? Or do you just want them to learn something new and think about something and ask questions of themselves? How do you plan on getting the reader to understand the topic? And when does the reader know, need to know this information? That's important for how fast you publish um, and also for things that are time sensitive. You know, there's, there's a little less polish maybe that you need to have. Like get, get that information out there as fast as you possibly can within reason. Also make sure that it's checked and okay. So if you don't already have a blog at your company, there are a number of ways that you can get published, you know, Medium. Do people still use Medium? I think I still read, sometimes, sometimes. And WordPress, of course, there are probably lots of other platforms I'm not aware of. Once again, please talk to me, I want to know, I want to learn. <laughs> and if you're ambitious to get your content up and you know, you're not already running a personal blog, you can remove the timestamp and then people don't know that you haven't updated your blog in a long time. Not that I've done that. <laughs> there are, you know, a number of awesome technical blogs out there. Code as Craft, Etsy's blog, fantastic. Pinterest has Medium articles that I really appreciate. CSS tricks, I really relied on them when I was, you know, teaching CSS and didn't know what CSS really did. And of course, I can't neglect the Google Developer blog. You should, you should check that out too. Okay, so what? So I've been talking for a bunch of time about docs. I, I hope I've convinced you, but, but in case I haven't, why does this matter? I'm gonna tell you. I think that reading is a really fundamental tool for learning. Reading is key. You don't, you don't get new information without having a way to absorb new information. But uh, reading books, reading articles, listening to podcasts, watching videos, etc. The way that we've learned all throughout our childhood and still into our adulthood, it's not enough. 
we have to be active learners. Reading is passive learning. Be an active learner. Write about the things you know. Talk about the things you know. You will know it better that way. And when I was in school preparing for major tests, uh, I used to have, you know, my big textbook and then write these detailed outlines for understanding what, what I was supposed to learn. Particularly, uh, one, of my, one of my classes, an AP class, advanced placement, was required for getting extra university credit before going. We had this textbook that, I don't know, it was a thousand pages long, it was awful. Uh, and we were required to come in with 40 page outlines. So, but you know, to my teacher's credit, I really absorbed that information when I copied down all of the things that happened in the chapter. I was much better prepared for the big test. And when I got my first technical writing job, the, the first task I was asked to do on day one was, okay, you need to write instructions for how to containerize an application with Docker. I didn't know what containers were. Didn't know I had heard it at that, that infrastructure conference and was like, um, soup container, sure. Didn't know what Docker was. Nope. It's like, that's, but yeah, I can totally do that. You just hired me and you want to give me money and I want you to give me money. So I will learn how to do it and I will write about it. And my first step, of course, was to go to Docker's documentation and then just try and do it. To, to build a little game, uh, the 2048 game, possibly you've played it, moving around numbers, very fun. I wanted to containerize that application. And in that process, I wrote down every single time I failed, and I failed a lot. Every step, okay, at step three, running this process, uh, all of a sudden, it's not, it's not doing what I expected to do. My goal was to make sure that I made a clear pathway so that other folks didn't make the same mistakes that I did. Knowledge is power. If you are a developer who thinks, well, I know it because I read all the things, so you should too, not super inclusive. There are some folks who don't necessarily have time to read all of the things. Uh, it's, it's really important to open opportunities to new people by writing and having good documentation. When I was a new developer, as I said, Stack Overflow, best friend. Oh, hey, still my best friend. Still love it and adore it, as I think many of us do. I was really lucky to have folks around me that I could ask questions of, but it's 2022. There's no excuse. Be inclusive of all people. Your knowledge is power. 100% of developers who write docs are better developers. This is a statistic that is very real. I didn't make it up. Um, it's real, I promise. Uh, don't look it up, though. <laughs> Not sure, though, if this should still be a priority for you. Product excellence depends on documentation existing. And I know that your time is precious. I know. I know that most companies, docs aren't necessarily a priority, and it's really important that there's a culture of documentation. You can't, it's really hard to be alone and be the only person who cares about documentation because then it gets pushed aside. You have other things to do. It's important that your manager cares about it, or if you are a manager, that you should care about documentation. It's really important. I hope that you agree with me that writing is important, it's part of the development process, that you feel inspired, I hope, to do a little bit more. So here are, here are my final six takeaways that you'll be able to, to run with and make some better docs. Be concise. You know who wasn't concise? I've been bashing him this whole talk, Shakespeare. Could have been more concise. Really long plays. <laughs> If there was a zombie apocalypse that was about to happen, you wouldn't say, warning, people who have once died are now roaming the streets and they look ill and you better get out of the way. What? No. Zombies, run, take cover. Like, don't waste people's time. Get out of the way. Tip two, start with a brain dump. Get everything out of your heads and onto the page. Don't 
worry so much about it being organized or grammatically perfect. Get the information out first, and then you can worry about the rest of it later. Your document should be thorough. It should know that there's a problem, address the problem, solve the problem. If you miss steps, readers are going to be left out. And you know, it's not always that the case that the docs are wrong. Readers don't always read. Um, I think about, again, kid self, super adorable, really wanted to make brownies. I had a box mix. You add oil and water and eggs, and then you have delicious, fudgy, amazing brownies. I didn't add the eggs. It was, after an hour, like truly the greatest strategy to take out this pan of sad, flat, chocolatey, not edible, like really not edible brownies. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Sometimes, that was, that was not the box mix's fault. That was my fault. I own that. That was my mistake. You can't always trust that the user is going to read every single step. They might still come to you and say, I don't know how to do this and you didn't tell me. And then you say, no, but it, here it is, docs. Uh, but have, if you don't have the docs, then you know, of course they didn't know how to do it. When you're documenting your code, remember your audience, remember who you're writing for. If you take one thing away, that's like the number one technical writer secret. Know who you're writing for because then you can write better things for them. If you're writing instructions for how to maintain your product after you're gone, the new engineer might have never experienced your code base. They might be really new. They might have um, just graduated from a, a code camp and be like, I'm ready to be an engineer, but now I'm stuck in this situation where I have to support a thing that's really complicated. Be nice to them. <laughs> Just because somebody is really smart and well-informed and has some expertise doesn't mean they're an expert in the things that you do. Number five, ask for feedback. Similar to the user experience process, it's really important to get feedback before you release your writing, if that's at all possible. Have your colleagues look at what you've written and they can tell you if you missed anything uh, or if, if there's any obvious uh, grammar mistakes that might make things confusing. You wouldn't release your code without testing, right? We all test, right? Yeah. Definitely, I also test not in production. No, I've never done that. Uh, if your code doesn't make sense, you know, it's good to, to have something to look back on to know, oh, that's what happened. That's what broke. And number six, write as you code. I lied. This is the thing that I want you to really take away. If you write documentation while you're building it, you are going to learn possibly or feel better about the process of documenting. It doesn't feel like this added burden after the fact of, I just want to move on to the next project. You know the most about your project as you're building it. Remember, write like a piece of confetti cake. All the sprinkles mixed in is what makes it the most beautiful, most wonderful piece of cake that there ever was. Sprinkle documentation throughout your process, and at the end, you'll have something clear, concise, and understandable. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I really was hoping for more than two people, and I am truly honored, so thank you. And any questions? And also, if you don't want to ask questions, you can come talk to me afterwards. You don't need to do it in a public forum or I'm on Twitter at HeyAWhite.